Hello, Good News TV viewers. Thank you so much for tuning into our YouTube channel and watching one of our videos. Before the program starts, we have just a couple really quick things we'd like to ask you to do. First of all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon to be notified when we release a new video. Next, be sure to click on the share button below if you'd like to share this video with your friends on social media. And finally, Type any comments you have about this program in the comments section below. We hope you enjoy this Good News TV production. God bless you. Well, thank you, Pastor Ed, and all of you. It has been a really wonderful experience to get to be here and to savor your friendship and your welcome. Uh, it's not difficult to begin to feel a little part of Arizona Conference and Camp Meeting. So I'm, uh, yes, I, I admit I'm grateful this is my last one, but, uh, I have enjoyed everyone until now, and you have been so gracious and, uh, and kind in your responses. In my advancing years, my forgetter improves. <laughs> and I am reminded that I forgot something this morning. And so I'm admitting it to all of you, I was asked by someone, where was that quotation that you started on the screen from? And I had told Betsy, oh, I, it was there, it's okay. I apologized to her because I realize now that we missed reading all of that quotation from page 64 of the marvelous little book, Steps to Christ. And some of you have said, that was so meaningful as far as we went, they wanted the rest of it. So you go to Steps of Christ, page 64, and you can get the balance of that particular statement, which I confess I go to often. I'm going to pray. Lord, you know who we are, where we are, and why we're here. And... We can't be here with any kind of real meaning and advantage and purpose without the leading of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I am asking that this old preacher and all of us from a human perspective get out of the way so you can minister to us in the way you choose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A number of years ago, there, were, uh, there was something called value genesis. Do any of you remember a time when value genesis was a study being done across North America? Uh, in particular, there were value genesis questionnaires distributed to North American Division academies for the purpose of trying to understand how much our students really know and understand about the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Among the several questions concerning Adventist beliefs were questions about Adventist lifestyle, the what's, and the whys, about Sabbath and Sabbath observance, and about the second coming of Jesus. Some of you may recall those questionnaires. These questions were thought to be important because of the very name of the church, Seventh-day Adventist, and the desire on the part of those who designed these questionnaires to make sure the students were absorbing what the textbooks 
we're supposed to be teaching. The third area of questions beyond, as I've said, lifestyle and Sabbath was the second coming of Jesus. There were three main questions students were asked to circle their preferred multiple choice answer. And here are the questions relating to the second coming of Jesus. Number one, do you believe Jesus is coming again? Yes, no, maybe. There were nearly unanimous yes answers to that question. The second question, do you believe, do you believe Jesus is coming again soon? Yes, no, maybe. Again, most answered yes. There were also maybe answers and even a few no's. The third question, will you be ready when Jesus comes? Yes, no, I hope so. What answer do you think was the majority answer? How did you know? <laughs> That's true. Most answered, I hope so. A few said yes, and even some said no. After hearing your understanding of the response to that question, I am not going to do what I thought of doing, is asking you where you are tonight but I don't think I want to embarrass anybody. Ask it anyway. <laughs> you are answering anyway, whether I ask it or not. <laughs> My question to us is, why are we hope so Adventists? That concerns me in fact, Betsy and I were visiting in a home not so long ago in another part of the West, and a man who is a dear friend, we've known for a long time, and Pastor Dan, I want to ask you a question. And that's not uncommon. I get a lot of questions I can't answer. And he asked, why is it that we are asked to love Jesus and I really don't love Jesus. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I love my wife and I love my children and there is expression and there is participation and there is response. But he said, I don't, I don't know how to love Jesus. We thought about that out loud and in the process, we came to the conclusion that we are followers of Jesus because this is who we are, this is who we've chosen to be, this is who we choose to become, but we do so intellectually and not experientially. You see, I can come and stand with many of you whom I've known for a period of time and put my arm around you and yours around me and we can stand there in an emotional embrace and, and believe that we love each other. We really do. And we would respond with love in many experiences of our lives. But we Adventists somehow, and I, I don't mean to be speaking critically, it's just, it's just reality. Uh, we would never, have, never think of being Pentecostal because that's somehow way off limits. But I want to tell you, there's something about that that answers all of the reserves about whether or not people have an emotional relationship with Jesus. Amen. And I guess that's the reason I appeal to you 
the other evening with the request that somehow the Seventh-day Adventist Church become the friendliest Christians anywhere there that we are. Amen. And I think if somehow we could exhibit expressions of really caring, really investing in each other and really being a part of each other and also put it, it in the context because Jesus loves us so much, we love him. This evening, I'm going to attempt and pray that you will leave this place with more joy than as a Seventh-day Adventist you've never ever experienced before. I want you to walk out of here with the kind of, of conviction and commitment and resolve that you love Jesus and you're going to serve him and nothing is going to get in the way and you're not going to keep that experience and that knowledge from anybody you run into. Amen. And let me suggest to you that I think that kind of testimony rubs off. And people will want to know, what is this business about loving Jesus? I, I'm going to get kind of... I guess I can call it pushy tonight. I've got somebody who's with me, I can tell that. Uh, I'm gonna get kind of pushy from the point of view that we have historically been very, very proud, appropriately so, of the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We know what we believe. We know about doctrinal positions that nobody else holds. And we have spent decades, oh, generations, mining this and trying to discover why this is the truth. And we've gone so far as to say, are they a part of the message? Do they know the truth? We ask ourselves, but is that the truth? Because I may forget to say it a little bit later, later, I want to tell you that I think we've been wrong in lots of that. And the reason I think we've been wrong is because the scripture clearly says Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. It is not a set of teachings that somehow identify us as better than anybody else. The ground at the foot of the cross, dear hearts, is level. And no matter what our roots may be, if we come to Jesus accepting his declaration that we are his friends. Our arms go out to encircle whomever is there, whether they know the same things we do or not. And I, I just pray that sometime we can alter our, our own personal understanding of who we are and what we stand for and recognize that we are the children of the Lord God, servants of Jesus Christ, and dependent upon him for everything we are and ever hope to be. So this evening, I'm going to impose on you something that I've never done before, and that is give you a little Bible word study that may give you a direction of understanding and thought that may let you have some more joy than you have experienced if in fact there has been uh, any hesitancy with that. Betsy and I, as you know, have come out of retirement and have accepted a ministry at the Loma Linda University Church. I am a part-time associate pastor for senior care 
They asked me and I said, yeah, I resemble that, why not? <laughs> and so there I am. And Betsy joins me in visiting these precious, precious saints. Uh, she is also officially a part-time associate pastor for estate planning. And that's a wonderful service that is provided to our community through her ministry. We visit folks two or three days a week. Uh, we have approximately 1,500, give or take, uh, seniors in the Loma Linda University Church. And 500 approximately of those are homebound and they become our primary parish. Uh, these dear, dear saints, I mean, it is so easy to love them and you spend a little time and all you have to do is ask the simplest question and you get stories that you cannot believe, but they're wonderful. And these people have been places, seen folks and done things that we can't even dream about. And we get to be in their presence. Uh, we were visiting a 101 year old who is going to be 102 on June 27. And I will be greeting her, by the way, if you've seen my birthday anniversary greeting stuff over uh, Loma Linda Broadcasting, or you can get it on YouTube also. But when I greet her for her 102nd birthday, he, she and I have a deal. I am to pull my earlobe. And so when I talk about her, I will pull my earlobe. And it, it is the most exciting thing to her. Amazing. Anyway, this 100, almost two-year-old has an iPad. And she reads her books on her iPad. She has all of the Conflict of the Ages series on her iPad. And that's what she reads as the most interesting and rewarding. She's a retired Seventh-day Adventist church school teacher. She's the widow of a, a local conference president. And she is a kick. We love her so much. And recently, and, and with all of these folks, we uh, get into real snuggle up conversations. And she was telling us about a grandson. And we were glad to know about the whole family. And uh, she told us about this grandson and then lamented that somehow he has gotten to the place where he does not buy into grandma's faith. And she is really concerned about that. She explained what a neat guy he is, so thoughtful of her and generous and all of that, but he doesn't think like grandma. And so I, I simply just said, you know, let's thank the Lord for him. Wow, to have a grandson like that who is so thoughtful and considerate of you. And uh, then I said, uh, remember, you love him, but God loves him more. Amen. And you can trust him into God's hands. To which she responded, Oh, if I just had that kind of faith. And I said, whoa. I didn't reprimand. I just said, let's thank the Lord for him. And you remember what Isaiah 49, 25 says, where God promised through the prophet, I will contend with him who contends with you and will save your children. And I says, please find courage in that. These are such lovable people. I got to tuck in a little tale. Um, we visit them in the hospital. We visit them in the nursing homes. We visit them at their homes. We visit them. There are 50, more than 50 board and care homes in Loma Linda. And so we wander among those places and see these dear hearts. And uh, we were in the hospital visiting this lady a senior, and I had, her, her name is Rose, her was, she has passed away. Her name was Rose, and so I had begun to call her Lady Rose. 
And she, I mean, she squared her shoulders and stood tall and, and uh, she thought, wow, I'm Lady Rose. <laughs> and I was talking on the telephone, uh, unfortunately, in her presence once, and I called another lady, Lady, whatever her first name was, and Rose got so upset, I thought I was the only lady in your life. <laughs> we saw her in the hospital, and uh, we had listened and shared with her and prayed with her. It was in the evening, and Betsy and I had gotten to the door, and I heard, Pastor Dan, come back here. And so I turned around, went back, and Lady Rose said, Pastor Dan, will you kiss me good night? <laughs> I kissed her good night. And we never parted again, except I kissed her goodbye. These dear, dear saints love to be touched. They're alone too much and forgotten. And somebody enjoys the wonderful privilege of ministering to them. But as Lady Rose, as I say, they go and die on us. And our family reduces. And I just wish you could be with me. I've had more funerals in the last 12 years than I had in the preceding 45. And in the course of this, I always request, did she, did he have a Bible? And most times I get the Bible and see this delicious marking of passages and notes in the margins that are testimony of who these people are and their walk with the Lord. In spite of that, there are some who are worried that they haven't done enough, been faithful enough, had enough faith to be ready when Jesus comes. And I ask myself, where did somebody go wrong in clarifying what this business of being ready for Jesus to come is all about? And so this evening, as I've already said, I want you to bear with me as I take you through a little word study in Scripture that will maybe give you a little different perspective on things that, can, that you can share with others who may wonder what it takes to be saved. So I'm going to begin with my title for this evening, which I hope is self-explanatory. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. And in the course of uh, developing this study, I have uh, come to some very familiar scripture portions that uh, actually uh, are familiar to us, but we haven't looked at them in context. And so I pray that we will somehow be able to do that this evening. I uh, refer next to Hebrews 11 and verse 6, where we do read, without faith it is impossible to please God. But as you read, our faith, our faith is our trusting in his faithfulness. Our trusting in his faithfulness, believing that he is, Hebrews 11:6, and that he is able to keep all that we have committed unto him. There's a little story in Acts chapter 16. We're going there in just a minute. Well, there we are. You remember when uh, the apostles were thrown in jail because they were stirring up some of the uh, devilish enterprises in that place and there came the earthquake and broke all the bonds and opened the doors and the jailer fearful that all of the prisoners had escaped he was about to kill himself when Peter cried out 
don't hurt yourself, we are all here. And he was so impressed with the fact that nobody had escaped on him that he asked, and this is the passage, he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, I said Peter, Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Do you believe he is? This passage says you are assured that you are saved. And if you know where you are and where you stand, what is there to be afraid of? I want to offer in teaching the scripture as Seventh-day Adventists, we ought to make these principles and these values first. And if we get to other things, great, because that's all a part of God's plan. I want to go now to another verse, and this is kind of the beginning of the, uh, of the word study. These, uh, this verse you know very well. And I want you to go through with me carefully. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live crucified, but alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, here I am in the flesh, I live by the faith, say the rest with me, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now there, there is an interesting thing I call to your attention. And you'll need to do your own home study on this. But as you came to that word in this verse, it says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Whose faith? The Son of God faith. Now, I've got to quickly allow for you that every modern translation says we live by faith in the Son of God, which is more than you and I can handle. That we have to generate more faith in the Son of God so that we can be saved. The original is faith of the Son of God. Now granted, it is not really a mistranslation. It's simply utilizing a preposition that can have at least six or eight different translations. It can be from and to and by and a whole lot of other prepositions. But for the teaching of the gospel, it needs to be faith of Jesus Christ. Now, we've got some more very uh, well-known scriptures here that I want to call to your attention for example, uh, let's go to uh, uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Look, it's the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of who? God. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And we have been encouraged. We have been approving. Uh, we've been certain about a teaching of righteousness by faith. I say, regretfully, we've allowed that to rest in our minds and hearts as our righteousness by faith rather than the righteousness of God and his faith. Now, I, I know this is going to be uh, an introduction of some ideas to you that you may not have thought of in the past. But I want to take us back through 
this a little bit by going to Romans 10, 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. I wish I had that kind of faith. I wish I had more faith. Establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I, I want to flesh that out a little bit here. And I've, I've done my own enlargement of some of the phrases in this passage. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, that is God's plan of justifying people or of declaring them righteous by faith in his son, and seeking to establish their own righteousness by their own efforts to make themselves righteous by their own works, to make good their own claims to eternal life by their merits, a behavior or performance-based justification or righteousness, this stands opposed to the justification of grace or to God's plan and have not submitted to or believed in the righteousness of God. I, in, in my research and preparation for this, I found a quotation in, uh, in the Bible commentator by the name of Barnes, his notes on Romans 10, 3. And uh, Mr. President, I, I, I really can't help but say we need to listen to this. Confidence in our own righteousness stands in the way of the progress of the gospel among people. I, I don't know how to really take that in, but I'm thinking here we are looking evangelistically and we've got populations of people who are our neighbors and we long for them to understand the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We need to be able to bear the testimony of our assurance of salvation in him so that they will want to also possess this reward. Today, the uh, Chisa mus musical group reminded me in one of their songs this afternoon of redeemed, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I, I looked up the words in my phone here. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed his child, present tense, and forever, future, I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing, for I cannot keep silent. His love is the theme of my song. Yes. You know, we've sung the songs, but I wish we understood the message of some of the songs as well. Well, hurrying on here, I uh, want to come to something that uh, I discovered, and it's on the screen right now. It, it's a commentary called Letter to the Romans, Earth Bible Commentary Series by Sigby K. Tonstad. Dr. Tonstad is a professor of New Testament in the School of Religion at the, at the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. He's also a physician. And he practices medicine in Norway, his home country, and back and forth with his teaching uh, at Loma Linda. He has written a commentary of Romans. And I'm just going to uh, summarize that very quickly for you right now. Um, we have understood and been grateful for the life and ministry of Martin Luther. You remember when he was trudging up the stairs on his knees and uh, was all tired and worn out? And he said, what's this all about? When I read in Romans, the just shall live by faith and not by sore knees. Well. And Dr. Tonstad has traced Romans' direct line back to the prophecies of Habakkuk. And, and if you, how many of you made a study of Habakkuk? Let me see your hands. Hey, I see some have. That's wonderful. But Habakkuk is three little chapters, and you hope you can pronounce the name, and you get on by it in a hurry. 
but it is integral to the teaching of righteousness by faith. In the first chapter of Habakkuk, here is that old prophet Habakkuk said, God, where are you? What's going on anyway? The, the evil folks are, are doing much better than the rest of us. You said that you were going to bless us if we would serve you. And Habakkuk goes on in chapter 1 complaining about what God isn't doing for them. Well. And you come to the second chapter and God just kind of says, okay. Uh, you seem to have forgotten that the sun comes up every day and there's summer and winter and there's things that that sprout and grow and whatever. And I just want to tell you that the just shall live by my faithfulness. And Dr. Tonsad said in his study and translation of Romans now that Paul had a direct line to the prophecies of Habakkuk that brings to us this wonderful teaching of righteousness by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not our faith that has to be turned up and turned up, but it is our trust yes. in the faithfulness yes. of our Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. And I think we had Habakkuk, there it is. Yeah, the just shall live by his God's faithfulness. Several other passages uh, have come to my attention that are so clear on this, but I'm going to confess to you that I miss them. Uh, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then Matthew 6:33 is such a delicious passage too. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things. Yes, Jesus had delineated a whole list of practical everyday uh, things that we depend upon, but is that not a dependence on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ as well? Well, I'm just looking at some of my notes here. I don't want to miss anything. Galatians 2.16, Ron. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For the, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And then one of our key texts that we use evangelistically a lot is uh, Revelation. Then the dragon was angry with the woman, went to make war with, on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God, and hold the testimony of who? Jesus. The testimony of Jesus. And Revelation 12, 17, oh, we just read that. And then 14, 12, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those, yes, who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus Christ. And I want to add another passage that my earlier study did not include. And uh, the dear folk in media here, put this in for me. Paul writes to the Philippian church, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of the grace with me. 
for God is my witness, how I long for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless, blameless until the day of Christ, blameless by his grace, not by our greater faith, having been filled with the fruit of the Spirit, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Dear hearts, I just pray that as it seems that we are still distant from our Lord's return, may we know that God is faithful, his righteousness is eternal, and supreme over all the distractions and disturbances of our earthly plight. Because of him, his love, his life-giving generosity, we live in hope of the certain fulfillment of his promise. He will neither, neither leave us nor forsake us. He will be with us until the very end. Many of the scriptures that we use to prove that Adventists are more right than anybody else fail to emphasize the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And my appeal to all of us is that we will find security in him. Now, all of our folks in Loma Linda that we see are not those who are, who are somehow anxious for more faith. We were with a dear couple just several days ago, and he is a retired missionary physician. His wife has been right with him every inch of the way. Just darling people, and we love to be with them even though their health is compromised. She now suffers in her 90s with ALS from the waist down. And she is uh, really suffering, but smiles through it all. As I concluded the prayer the day we were with them, right on the end of the prayer, she said, Pastor Dan, I want to tell you something. And of course, I want to hear something. And she said, before I was in this condition, and before Dell, her husband was suffering the physical complications that he now suffers, I had a couple of experiences that give us hope today. And she told about two falls that she suffered. And she said, one of them, the first one, I, I simply fell backwards in kind of a precarious place. She wasn't trying to be uh, careless, but she fell on the ground, but she said, I didn't fall. It was like the Lord laid me on the ground. And as I just turned my head, here was this ugly rock. If I had hit my head on that rock, I might not still be here. She said, that was testimony to me of God's faithfulness. And even though I have ALS, everything is okay because of Jesus. I have one other friend I recently visited. He's much younger. He has been diagnosed with acute leukemia. His brother died two years ago with the same diagnosis. And as he was speaking with me, he said, Pastor Dan, I want you to know I'm not worried. It's going to be okay. And I said, tell me about that. He said, well, one day I awakened early in the morning and in the realization of what was happening and there were some unhappy things taking place in his life, he said, I didn't know what might happen next. 
But he said, it was as clear as if a voice spoke to me, don't you worry, Dick, everything is going to be okay. And with his present diagnosis, he said, that's still the message I'm taking with me. Everything is going to be okay. I'm going to close with one other passage of Scripture from Jude, verses 24 and 25. May you accept this verse for yourself. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his throne. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore, for however long it is. Please understand that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. But you maintain that relationship on a day-to-day -day experience with Jesus. God bless you all. Okay, see you in the kingdom. sing it individually let us bring more power to it as we sing it together great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness O God my father there is no shadow of turning with thee thou change
Indeed, Father, great is thy faithfulness unto me and me and me and every me in this room. Morning by morning, summer and winter, thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word, the certainty of being together without feeble efforts on our part, all dependent on the matchless power, grace, love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we love Jesus for what he's done for us, and we want to live for him day by day in the days that you give us. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.